Star Wars Republic Commando is one of those games where I kind of regret playing, because now I can only think of one thing. When are we getting a sequel? As of today, we're not. And my voice adds to the millions of voices who have cried out in terror and were suddenly silenced. The mid-2000s era was an amazing time for Star Wars fans, and Star Wars Republic Commando feels like it got left behind. We're going to look back in what will be the first in a series of retrospective reviews here. This will be part of a nostalgia series that I'm working on that goes through a plethora of older games, mostly from the PS2 and Xbox 360 era. Please be sure to like, comment your favorite Star Wars game, subscribe, and hit the bell for more great trips down memory lane. I will eventually dip into more recent games, but my backlog is deep and full of top tier games that I do need to get through. So buckle up. Let me start with some parameters and set some expectations for you all so we're on the same page. Hi, I'm the Colbert. This is my first video in this format, review, so I will be doing my best on this video. That's all I can promise. My gaming experience, though, stems from being a professional streamer on Twitch and a lifetime of gaming prior from the Game Boy all the way to today. I have refrained from watching most videos on this game, so not to tarnish or mess with my own view of the experience. But I will say that like every other reviewer, I have my own set of biases that I will do my best to set aside. Lastly. This is off my first and only playthrough of the game. Unless I'm inclined to play more, I will only really be judging the game based on my first experience. I will make mistakes and probably not hit the level of depth I strive for, but I will strive. Quick side note, the game ran terribly on my system, at least off the Steam version. I did some deep research on the darker side of Google and found out that Good Old Games has a wonderful mod that fixes the majority of the frame rate and resolution issues. I'll be sure to leave a link below for those that are interested in playing with this resolution and frame rate. As an interesting side note. As a casual Star Wars fan, I missed my chance to play this back in the day for a slew of reasons. Probably Kingdom Hearts 2. This game in particular I felt was a great place to start. While not a 10 out of 10, each person I have met declared that they had a great time with this game. Today I'm going to drag you through the murky underbelly of Star Wars and show you the side of the war that they hadn't explored in quite a while, at least in the games. Turning on the game, the UI felt familiar, so much that I could have easily mistaken it for Battlefront 1 or 2, but I'm just going to chalk it up to some sort of uniform Star Wars UI design. All the pieces are here, especially one of the most iconic elements to any Star Wars franchise, the music. Upon opening the game, you're met with a choir preparing for war in an alien language. While they took some liberties with their own theme, the heart of Star Wars music can be found throughout the game, adding that little something extra to remind you you are in the heart of the Star Wars universe. The composer for Republic Commando, Jesse Harlan, who had also worked in Star Wars Galaxies, the Episode 3 tie-in game, and Battlefront 2, invented the Mandalorian language called Mandoa, and would later be fully fleshed out by author Karen Travis, who wrote the Commando books. The language is invented for the heavy choir theme that greets you upon hitting the main menu. It is underrated and fits right into the Star Wars musical canon, or in this case, Legends. Speaking of the music, I probably won't be able to play much of the music on here for copyright reasons, since it is mostly just the classic Star Wars music that you and copyright people love. So just imagine it's always some of the most recognizable cinematic soundtracks of all time, playing as you accomplish your mission objectives and big explosions are happening everywhere. Let's just ignore the ending credit song, which while fun, I did not care for as much. I am sorry. The game starts you off in a quick montage showing your clone training, development, and showing that you are different from your other clones. You are better than your clone brothers. Elite among your peers. The clones you do end up running into in the game show some reverence to you, which is always a nice touch in games, where the common soldier or regular NPC gives you a little recognition when it's earned. Your commando, the one that you play, is named Delta 38 or Boss, voiced by the OG clone Django Fett and modern Boba Fett Tamora Morrison. You're the leader, the one who calls the shots, and drops the one-liners whenever you can. You meet your other squad mates here, Delta 40, Fixer, honestly the best soldier ever, couldn't even remember he was there. No lip, just action. Played by Andrew Chaykin. Uploading and linking with your visor, sir. Then, Delta 62, Scorch, the talkative one to group, the funny one, the classic explosive expert comic relief, voiced by Karth from Star Wars Knights of the Republic, aka Raphael Sabarge. Eat plasma, you stupid droid! Yeah! 
Finally, the sketchy one, Delta 07, Sev. He's the one that probably would not be able to adjust to civilian life without mountains of therapy after. And he's voiced by Jonathan Cook. 07 locking into your hut, sir. Getting acquainted with the locals, eh, Sev? That was fun. He's also supposed to be your sniper, but each commando can do everything equally well. More on that later, since it's just personality flavoring at this point. These are your clone brothers in arms and their chemistry flows great. The one-liners, the trash talk, felt right at home in this darker tone of the Star Wars universe. The reason I brought up the voice actors at all is because I thought it was a nice touch that they all had worked with previous and future Star Wars projects in some fashion. Loved the performances, they felt gritty, immersive, and the chemistry was apparent. I did care for them, especially at the end when the story well, finally starts to get interesting, but we're gonna continue on. The game's story unfolds over the course of three different and unique campaigns that deal with specific aspects of the Clone Wars from the perspective of the Special Forces Clone Army, the Commandos. The story begins in previously mentioned montage of events as you grew up and were trained alongside your three clone brothers, Fixer, Scorch, and Sev to become the best of the best. The sequence ends with you each boarding separate ships on Kamino, the clone homeworld, with the rest of the clone army in order to begin the battle of Geonosis and kick off the Clone Wars. The rest of Delta Squad are briefed by the advisor, your hologram assistant who you see throughout the game, who briefs you on your mission that you are going deep behind enemy lines to find and kill Sun Feck, the leader of the Geonosians. You are dropped off with another standard clone, alone, as you head into battle and the tutorial area. I felt this was an odd choice to start you and your squad split up but I get the utility of it. It helped break down the tutorial effectively progressing through each area without having to be overwhelmed by all the squad mechanics that you learn if shortly after. You land in the Geonosian arena after the battle has begun. You blaze through the strangely colored droids, flying Geonosian warriors, and other average clones who drop like flies around you. I couldn't find a reason for the color change to the droids online, but I'm gonna give an educated guess this is big brain time. as it to being a stylized choice or a game design purpose as it makes the droids and enemies pop out better from the environment. After a while, it doesn't matter too much as each group of enemies is uniquely designed, and I could probably see how the original color of the droids from the movies looks very similar to the original color of the Geonosians from the Clone Wars. There's only so many shades of brown. You're introduced to most of the gameplay elements, including your HUD, which can get in the way at times, but I personally felt it added to the immersion. I found out later you can remove the helmet HUD overlay aside from the important information like health and objectives. Playing that way though did not feel like Republic Commando, felt more like a Halo clone, and the fun wiping feature seemed awkward without the helmet overlay. Side note, this is probably the most violent Star Wars game I have seen up to this point. You're quickly introduced to Magda, it is your field aid station and your best friend, because enemies are decently accurate and explosions wreck your shields and health. Later, you can send your squad mates over to heal up as you view each of their color-coded respective health displays. Many times I was killed because I didn't fully heal my squad before entering a droid-infested room. The health regen is plentiful and should be utilized whenever. Lore-wise, your squad and other commanders are the only ones equipped with equipment that can utilize the Bacta tanks effectively. So it's kind of funny how no other clone or enemy can use Bacta to heal themselves quickly on the battlefield, especially since the Bacta stations are more readily available than McDonald's restaurants. There are so many. As you continue to work your way through and find your mission target, you collect the members of your squad, and they're all introduced in ways that would lead you to believe that each squad member would be more efficient at different tasks. I thought Scorch would be better with explosives, Fixer with tech, and Sev with sniping or heavy weapons. None of that comes into play outside of just regular conversation. It would have been a much different experience altogether. In the end, it was the right call to make and made the game more streamlined. I could see it being frustrating having to make sure each clone commando was in the right spot instead of the current rotation they provide. Most of the time, you are just pointing and telling your guys where to take positions or handle different objectives. Like you place one person on a turret, then you place the other one throwing grenades. You take a sniping position and the last commando needs cover as they plant an explosive or hack a system. It would take an eternity to make sure your right commando in the right position if they are all over the place. Which leads us to our one big flaw in the gameplay that does wear off after a while. I'm not a huge fan of the majority of the game boiling down to holding the action key or telling someone else to hold an action key for 10 seconds, a minute, or two minutes. It's fun when there are multiple targets and that's where the tactics and strategy come in, but the game loses momentum when you breach a door or have to disable a mine when there are no enemies around every two minutes. I could have done without half of them. I don't mind if the game is shorter, especially if they could add a quality product. 
I will give the devs the benefit of the doubt, especially over a decade ago, that it was maybe a way to break up the loading time of each game, but honestly, my knowledge of game dev at this moment is not quite at the depth I would like, so I will hold back any ignorant critique. You eventually run into a few enemies throughout Geonosis that give the game enough enemy diversity that it never feels stale, especially the super battle droids, which I will have nightmares about. Running into a bit of trouble here. We're under attack, sir. We got a droid situation, boss. They are beast. Their armor is thick and their guns demolish your health. Even when you command your squad to focus fire on them, the only time it was truly effective was when they were all in sniper positions or some key locations to help take them down faster. This was the first time I went down the game and I would probably die multiple times in my first playthrough just off one or two SBDs, sometimes even more. Your squad has three options once your health hits zero. Maintain current orders, which means they'll keep fighting and clear the room. Recall and revive, which means they'll attempt to rescue you, and depending where your corpse crumpled upon the floor, are very susceptible to being killed themselves. So it was wise to hopefully only call them over if you landed behind some cover or the enemies were weak. If it was a crowd of super battle droids, you might as well select the third option, reload last save game. There is really not a great autosave feature in this, so save and save often. One thing I need to address, I didn't know how I could easily handle most super battle droids, if you just shoot their arms off instead of aiming for the chest. I was pleasantly angry when I found out how much easier the game would have been if I just shot off some of their limbs. Nice job, team. But hey, it probably added to the experience and dread of fighting super battle droids. After you and your squad team up, your squad fights through groups of Geonosians and droids to finally reach Sun Feck, before he's able to escape aboard his ship. After he is taken out, another unidentified non-Geonosian ship takes off. With the Geonosian leader dealt with, Delta Squad heads into the bowels of the planet in order to destroy the droid construction factories to help tip the battle in the Republic's favor on the planet's surface. The squad fights through multiple hives and clusters of Geonosian warriors and swarms of other smaller enemies to finally shut down the jamming device to locate the factory's exact coordinates. After finally going through and shutting down the facility to help turn the tide of the battle on the surface, you're evacuated and presumably taken to your next mission infiltrating the droid control ship still docked on the planet's surface. I do love the ominous tone set here by the music and the screams of the Geonosian warriors. It really brings up the dread level that feels a little alien even to that galaxy far, far away. The next section of missions was where I started to feel squad placement became extremely important, resulting in multiple deaths if I wasn't utilizing all the tactics at my disposal. These are also the missions where you start to run low on ammo frequently, since most of the enemies take more than a few shots to take down. The gunplay in this game is where it really shines. It felt super cool to shoot some of the weapons that are laid before you. Your clone is equipped with a DC-17M interchangeable weapon system, or a gun base that can be rotated through a rifle, a sniper, and a grenade launcher. You also get a great little sidearm, pistol, and a special weapon in your third slot as well as five different grenades and a cool little wrist blade that can one-shot most weaker opponents. But with bigger weapons, you just get to use the butt of your gun. The grenades are amazing, and most of the time will be the determining factor if you can dispose of enemies quickly or not, depending on which grenade you pick. Your pistol has unlimited ammo and is a decently powerful, but can't fulfill your main gun's role, which is almost everything else. It's a standard rifle mode is my favorite since it made me feel like most like a clone. And besides just overall utility each of the weapons has, their own ammo and are not sharing from the same pool even though they share the same base weapon. Even with that nice little feature, I was usually stuck with the special weapon or the pistol due to ammo shortages. I don't think that was a bad thing, but it definitely added a layer of tactics I wasn't ready for. Also, friendly fire is a thing. There was a point later in the game where I found a bug and I had to shoot one of my squad mates to make the objectives update. Which was a good thing because I hadn't saved in a bit. Just another reminder to make sure to save your game at every turn. And last thing, the Geonosian Special Weapon is one of the coolest and creepiest gun designs I have ever seen with special attention to the idle sound it makes. All fetched up here. Back to the missions, the squad makes its way through infested canyons in order to reach the docked Separatist core ship in order to retrieve the launch codes which will hopefully prevent the droid army from escaping Geonosis. Before breaking into the ship, you fight your first boss of the game, a dwarf spider droid. Ironically though, it's the biggest enemy in the game for you. Utilizing the whole arena, you eventually take it down when you focus on the weak points on the siege unit. The fight while challenging left me wanting a bit. 
The following part of the mission definitely filled that want. Your squad breaks up in order to navigate the interior of the core ship. This is the mission with the most stealth and introduces the droidica, and my least favorite because it was challenging not because it was bad enemy tool, the droid dispenser. This thing here spits out hella droids. Usually you can take them out with the heavy enough weapons, but most of the time the most effective way is having you or one of your squad mates run up and set up a bomb, which takes 20 seconds. Each time, then you can blow it up. I would have hoped the bombs would have taken a few seconds less to set up, but I do not want to keep bringing that up. I don't believe I saw an end to the amount of droids you have, but it did keep the blood pressure up, especially when there are more than one of these dispensers in the present area. You and Delta Squad teams up again eventually, as the mission reaches the climax at the bridge, where you and your squad mates rush to the center console to get the launch codes out of the Separatist computer, while under attack by waves of enemies and turrets. The bridge gets rushed by multiple droids of all shapes from each side as you and your squad tries desperately to hold on. This was the most challenging moment up to that point, for sure. The inching increase in difficulty in the game never felt unfair, even if I died multiple times. The beauty of this game is it allows you to solve different problems with some creativity, granted if the area is a little more wide open. There is no one specific way you need to solve it. In the end, you are able to get the codes and escape through a back door and get evac'd, bringing the Geonosis campaign to a close for Delta Squad. Geonosis had a diverse range of shooting galleries from open caves, tight corridors, and a decently engaging boss fight which sadly will be the only real boss fight in the game. The first planet does a great job introducing you to mechanics in a natural way and gives you plenty of tools to make the rest of the game fun. But it does harp and give some red flags ahead of time, including some just okay level design later on. You may recognize your next objective, the Prosecutor, an acclimated class Republic assault ship under the command of Captain Martz. The Prosecutor was our first home. We were stationed there for a long time. The last patrol was the Corellia sector, defending Republic trade routes against separatist activity. But we lost contact. The game jumps ahead nearly one year later in the depths of space. Delta Squad is tasked with investigating a derelict acclimator assault class ship called the Prosecutor. You think with the Edge Lord naming of the ships is a red flag to the Jedi, but there are no Jedi here. Actually, there's only one lightsaber even seen in the entire game, and it's in this section. An elegant weapon for a more civilized time, huh? Well, guess what? Times have changed. Your squad boards the vessel from different positions. Sneaking your way through the ship's interior, you see corpses and blood of clone troopers who were massacred by scav droids who tried to dive bomb them, electrocute you, or attempt to drill into your helmet. You're here now, so no need for that, eh? Look Thanks out. for the rescue. <laughs> Of good genes. After sneaking through the vents to escape, you meet up with Sev, who is knocked out by a Trandoshan. Ah, uh, there you are. Give me a minute and I'll join you. Just have to slice this core for the sensor logs. That did it. Now, uh, hold on. Got some static here. Sev, can you read me? Come in. Come in, Sev. Pass. 46 2. Come in. Be on the lookout for armed hostiles. Lizards are tough critters, for they are fast, strong, and seem to have a decent health pool. It did take me a moment to figure out how to deal with them. You are introduced to another weapon, the Trandoshan shotgun and heavy machine gun type. Both fun time. Hmm. An energy weapon that looks like a slug thrower. I didn't think lizards were that nostalgic. You dive deeper into the ship to attempt to discover why the ship was targeted in particular. Superior training. This deluxe model is the only thing standing between you and a bloody death. So you'd best be showing some respect, trooper. Oh! Yes, sir. What are your orders, sir? Hold the line. Kill any lizards you see. I'm gonna get to the bottom of this. Will do, sir. This mission overall does begin to develop an actual story about what you and your squad need to accomplish. You eventually save Sev with Fixer, only to find out that Scorch is being held in one of the holding cells by the Trandoshan slavers. I've located his cell. He's in cell number 2187, down the hall to the right. Delta 6-2 has been located. Did I miss anything important? No. Did you get the data? 
Yeah, yeah, they searched me, but I, I hid the data pretty well. Where exactly? Uh, you don't want to know. Roger that. Doubtous, After freeing the Scorch, you make your way to the bridge to disable the slaver's jammer that is crippling the Star Destroyer. The squad discovers that the Trandoshans are enslaving the Wookiees on Kashyyyk, and you have to get the ship's log back to the Republic. But the ship needs to be cleared of all hostiles. Take her down. I think it. I see it. A Trade Federation battleship. Yeah, not even you can see into hyperspace, Sev. No, it's on the edge of the system. Take a look. Watch out, sir. That force field's unstable. Oh, blast. This will be a challenge. You find your way back to the hangars to defend another assault by a core ship or battleship. This part was the right amount of strategy, chaos, and challenge that made the game worth replaying. I'd come back just for this section again. You fend off multiple hangers from invading droids by shutting off the hangar gates and the droid dispensers. Culminating in you jumping in an ATTE walker to fend the last hangar, then destroying the invading battleship with the derelict ship's cannons. No one steals a ship from the Republic while we're around. It was epic to say the least and a heck of a lot of fun. Loved how each hangar was a little bit different, how you set up, where you place charges, where you position your squad. It all led up to a lot of creativity, which was really nice to see. The mission's scope and scale felt like you were actually making a difference in the Clone Wars as opposed to just being a little side character. The elements of horror, strategy, and difficulty were at its peak, and it was very clear how well thought out everything was. This was clearly the best of the three campaigns presented to you. The third and final campaign, you and your squad head to Kashyyyk. You stealthily and skillfully work your way through the jungles and Wookiee slave camps, releasing those classic monsters from their cages. I've accessed the network. Let's go. Some help and then some escape. The ones that stick around have some of the most intense renditions of the walking carpets we have the pleasure of seeing, eventually leading you to Tarful from Episode 3. This game was supposed to come out right around Episode 3 and lead into the movie sort of like a sneak peek. This was more than likely people's first experience with the Magma Guards, Tarful, and General Grievous, who is fully cloaked, of course, and you will see very briefly as he skirts his way back to his iconic ship. The Magma Guards should have been a bit more of a challenge. While fun to fight and fast, they were dispatched pretty easily compared to some other challenges met along the way. You and the Wookiees you rescue start a rebellion on Kashyyyk to begin fighting off the invading Trandoshans, droids, and Geonosians, sort of a cluster of all three on the planet. It was a nice culmination of all the enemies you faced up to that point. Whether or not it makes sense, it was still fun and added a bit of the variety to the conclusion. The rest of Kashyyyk is arguably forgettable, except the last mission where you and your squad take out Separatist assault ship above the Wookiee city. Immediately after, Sev is overheard on the comms being attacked and presumably captured or killed. It is unclear. Squad, regroup. We're going after Siv. Negative. Negative 3-8. New orders came through from the Jedi Generals. Clear the area. Evac now. I don't care if they came from Master Yoda himself. As a matter of fact, they did, soldier. Now get your squad out of there. Blast our orders. 40? He's right, boss. We gotta evac. Sir, we have to go back. Delta Squad begins to question their authority and attempt to go after Sev in sort of an interesting moment that could and should have been developed further. This was the point in time where their personalities truly started to shine. You begin to see how much they actually cared for each other and made them more unique and interesting to me other than just clone soldiers. Unfortunately for Sev, your squad is unable to go rescue him as the invasion of Kashyyyk by the Republic has begun, thanks to your efforts in laying the groundwork for the counterattack. 
Yoda appears on a comm and places the whole burden of the upcoming battle on your squad as you take the front. Then, roll the credits. Right when it was getting interesting, they pulled the rug out from under you because, hey, episode three is coming. And I get why they did it, but it definitely stings. In a strange comparison, this reminds me of the 2010 Russell Crowe movie directed by Ridley Scott, a very average historical action movie with some decent sequences, but when the story finally started to get you drawn in and interesting, the credits rolled. Same kind of thing, they're technically both prequels leading up to a story of more renown, but that alone shouldn't justify them from getting an adequate conclusion instead of being left on a cliffhanger. Obviously, there were some indications that they definitely wanted a sequel, and there were some hints in some of their articles at a possible sequel in the future, but sadly, I doubt we will ever get it. As optimistic as I would like to be, we're probably not going to be seeing a sequel anytime soon. Maybe a Bad Batch video game with the same kind of features, which would be fine, but I don't think we'll ever see the conclusion to this storyline. I believe in media standing on its own, and I don't believe in having to read books or watch other movies or TV shows just to get the full picture of the present media. The art should stand on its own. I'd be doing you a disservice if I didn't draw your attention to some critiques on this game. Even years later, most of the game is, is mid to pretty good at best. Most of the first campaign and last campaign felt stretched thin. There are only so many times I can have a mission just be hold F or send your squad mate to hold F on a specific computer door or explosive. I wish there was some way to mix it up, maybe a timer, an actual escort mission, or a boss that actually was a boss. I understand they wanted to draw away from, you know, Jedi and magic and the force and all that, and I know what I said, I'm just saying space magic, alright? Just imagine Han Solo, okay? Maybe an evil Jedi boss fight, or even fighting a different version of the Magma Guards, a prototype super battle droid, or even fighting one of the spider droids you see early on in the game but never get the chance to fight. I'm sure early Star Wars games were held up by LucasArts a little differently back then, especially ones so closely tied into the movies. Talking with some connections in the gaming industry, I have learned that LucasArts is a bit strict when it comes to creativity in terms of lore. Everything from color of certain items in the game to how things sound. It's, they're very on top of it. I do have to give them credit, but it is what it is. It would have also helped the game's story a bit more if we had started close to the end or had gotten another area where we were left. The mission length felt a bit too long or it overstayed its welcome. Republic Commando more than likely could have shaved about a quarter of its time. It would have been a bit better. You notice they start to run out of ideas toward the end when you have to fight three spider dwarf droids back to back to back with less and less squad members. But I believe that things that made this special was an attempt by the developers at making this a boots on the ground realistic attempt at what the Clone Wars was like when you're not given all the perks of being a Jedi. I absolutely think this game is worth your time, especially if you can get the mods to make the resolution and frame rate issues fixed. Now whether or not I deserves a sequel or remake, I have said before. I think it does deserve some sort of sequel, but whether or not that'll ever happen, I don't want to get my hopes up too high. But what do you think? Do you think this deserves a sequel or a remake? What were some of your favorite moments from this game or franchise? And I'd love to hear some other Star Wars games you'd like me to check out. Just a quick thank you to all the patrons that supported this channel, and if you'd like to support as well, there is a link to the Patreon down below. And a quick thank you to everyone who just even just tuned in, liked, commented, or even shared this video. I would love to make more of these, and I'd like to get a little bit faster at them. So thank you so much again. I think I've said that like a bunch of times, but I can only say it so many times. So be sure to like, comment, and subscribe for more. Catch you soon.